we are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. At least I hope we are because <laughs> I'm pressing buttons here and uh, and I think I think we're all set. I'm Lindsay the Frugal Crafter here with Sarah. Hi. And if you have any questions as we go along, you can type the word question in all caps in the um, in the chat box and the moderators might help you out. If it's something that they can't help you with, Sarah will ask me. Please keep your questions related to watercolor and we will be using, and this is optional, you don't have to do this, but towards the end, we are gonna use some colored pencils and a few pastels. Um, Again, you can follow this all the way through with watercolor. You don't have to use those things. But if you do have questions about those particular mediums that I'll be bringing in, you can ask those as well. We just wanna make sure that the replay is super useful for people watching it down the road when they can't ask questions. So um, that just kinda of helps everybody stay on track. And uh, this video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. There is a coupon code in the video description to save you some money on your next order. And I'll have all these supplies I use today linked up over at Jerry's. And I thank them for their support. Do you have anything to add today? I don't. Okay, and the furnace just started because um, it's heating up some hot water, so it won't be going for very long. I apologize if there's background noise. Uh, we're going to begin by wetting the entire paper here, and you can use whatever large brush you have, and you just wanna wet the entire thing. I like to do this because it keeps you from getting a kind of cut and paste look on your painting, so it helps everything kind of be married and harmonized. Now, a lot of people have been asking me lately about what pencil I use because they're worried about smudging. I just use any old mechanical pencil, honestly, and you might even see a little bit of smudging when I first wet it, but it, it tends to kind of wash off and then whatever's left behind doesn't seem to smudge. So I haven't had any issues. Um, if you were using a water-soluble graphite, you would have some, you'd have big time smudging, but any old regular pencil should be fine. And I am going to begin with uh, mixing up kind of some uh, neutrals. I'm going to start with um, some brown here. This is burnt sienna. I'm going to add some thalo blue to it. Now since it's not ultramarine blue, it's thalo, it gives us actually a beautiful earthy green color. And then to get rid of some of that green, I'm gonna add in a little bit of my uh, rose red. That gives me a kind of a nice brown, but I'm also integrating a lot of the colors that I'm going to need. I'm gonna throw this back in here, maybe a little bit more blue in there to cool it. I'm gonna go right over part of the glass because um, you will see through the glass and you'll see some of those colors. I'm trying not to get on the cherries though, so just be aware of that. And I'm trying not to really get on the white napkin that they're kind of resting on. You can put some shadow in the napkin. I'm just gonna wipe the excess paint off my brush and just kind of tint it a little bit add some shadows, not too close to the cherries. My brush is pretty dry, so I find that when I'm using a dry brush on damp paper, um, as long as my brush is not very wet, the color's not gonna flow too much on me. It's kinda like when you wet the back of your paper too, it just evens out the tension of the water and you can control it a lot better. I'm gonna lift up a little bit of the, um, the paint on the edge of the napkin. And I'm also gonna blot it for a little texture. I'm using hot press paper today, and I did my sample piece on cold press paper, so throughout the painting, I'll probably bring in my uh, the painting I already did, just so you can kind of compare the difference between hot press and cold press. Hot press is smoother, almost like a drawing paper, but it's robust enough to handle your watercolor. I'm gonna go in with a little bit of that grayish color inside the glass, again, just trying to avoid the cherries. Just blot them if you do get that on the cherry color. Just wanna get some of that dark in there. I'm gonna go around this uh, mint here. Now I wanna get some kind of brighter blue on the, uh, the napkin here because as light comes through glass, it does carry some of the color over. 
And also this napkin line should continue across the paper. So I'm just blotting that out. So I have that kind of ridge of the napkin. And I'm just gonna grab some of the blue on its own. This is phthalo blue. We're only using four colors of watercolor and they are linked or listed in the video description. You can use whatever brand you want. You don't have to have this brand. And it doesn't have to be a smooth application here because it should be a little um, dappled. And you can drag some of that up into the glass if you want to. So if you can get a lot done in this first um, bit of coloring, it's gonna save you some time down the road. And I'm using that number 30 round that comes in the value set of the uh, Mimic Squirrel brushes. They are a 100% um, uh, faux squirrel. So if you wanna have the, um, really the usability of a real fur brush, but you don't wanna have the price tag or the um, cruelty of it, then give these a try. I think they come the closest to a, a fine animal hair brush because um, they have a little bit more snap to them than than the other like that they after I've gotten used to these I don't like my Princeton Neptunes quite as much because they just feel very soggy to me once they get wet Princeton Neptune is a wonderful brush but I've noticed that as I've used those more and more I've really preferred that they have that slightly bit a um, little more point and more snap to them and I feel like I can paint with them longer before they get completely waterlogged and I have to let them dry out and I and I feel like that happens more frequently with um with other, and that definitely happens frequently with actual animal hair brushes. So actually they might even be, I personally like them better than animal hair brushes for that reason. I don't have to let them rest. Uh, Laura R, how does grading of watercolors work? I've seen some paints advertised as artist grade but reviewed as creamy, which are not two things I pair together. Creamy tends to come with fillers. That's true, yeah. Or um, or it tends to be more of like an Eastern watercolor. So you can have artist grade watercolors that are um, like an Eastern watercolor, like your Ganzai Tambay colors. They're meant to be painted on unsized paper, so they have to have that body to them so that they don't um, they don't feather. It's usually not so much creaminess like filler, but it's creaminess as in it's got usually an animal glue in it that keeps it almost it's probably like a gelatin or something because it keeps almost that gelatin consistency um kind of thick like a thick water if you've ever made jello like jigglers and you've made them thick did that consistency and um that so that's how it could be artist grade but still be very creamy um card makers really like those because if you're painting on cardstock versus watercolor paper um, and you want that watercolor look but you don't want the you know maybe you don't want to stamp on watercolor paper because it's too rough or you don't want that expense you can control that paint a lot better on cardstock and other um, crafting papers and get the watercolor look but it's not going to go everywhere and it's not going to feather and bleed so that would be one instance but there's really no like governing body out there that that judges paint and says your artist quality your student quality it's left up to the manufacturers to decide and not all manufacturers are going to be completely honest with their rating system i've got a little um looks like a little eraser bit there on my paper i don't want to brush it off until i'm sure my paper is dry otherwise i might leave a fingernail mark or i might leave a smudge on my paper hot press paper is less forgiving to fingernail marks and um, scratches, scra uh, scrapes and scratches. So kind of baby your hot press paper a little bit more than you would your cold press. And hot press refers to the, um, the surface. That means it's smooth. If you think of a hot iron um, pressing down on your paper to make it smooth, it will make it easy to remember. Uh, Patricia Kinney, how do you decide which brand of watercolor to use? Um, it's kind of funny, and I don't know if, if, I've been painting with watercolor for decades, so each brand has its own unique characteristics, so it's kind of like if you think about you want to hang out with a friend, or go to the beach with a friend, or go to lunch with a friend, you might be in, in the mood for a certain personality, and so that's how I pick my watercolors, I'm in, mo in the mood for a certain personality, so I'm going to invite my Turner watercolors out to play, or my core watercolors out to play. Some watercolors are more serious and, you know, um, I'm going to save those for 
you know, my super duper thought out precious projects and other ones are just kind of fun and I'm just going to, you know, grab them and have a good time. So it's the, I, I feel like each paint kind of has its own personality because I've been painting with them for so long and I just know that some paints are going to work better and some color palettes that I have, I might have different colors and a different brand and I just know those colors are going to work better for what I'm trying to paint. That's pretty much it. You don't need to have so many. I just really... I just really enjoy it. Like someone who collects cars, they, you know, you only really need one car, but you know, you might have several cars and you pull out a different car for a different occasion or for what you felt like driving that day. It's a much cheaper hobby than uh, <laughs> collecting cars. <It> is. <laughs> Although <laughs> maybe not by much sometimes. Less storage space. That's true. I'm going to start by putting in just a little bit of shading in the background. Um, the first, my first, version of this painting and you're going to see when I just have the background in I was going to just leave the background plain and maybe crop it closer but then I decided because my daughter had said geez the background looks kind of meh and or says is it finished your background doesn't look finished and that made me think that well if I'm going to crop it anyway I might as well play with the background and see what I can do and uh, see if I can find something that you know would make it look a little more interesting I intended to side load with this but my brush was too wet so the paint all went along the bristles but that's okay as long as I work quickly I will be able to work with this uh, because it's thalo blue in this mix I have to be careful because uh, it's very staining even though it has burnt sienna the thalo blue is going to stain my paper so I'm just working over that rough edge uh, that I didn't want to have just want to give that napkin a little bit of um, uh, I want to push it away from the background just a little bit of shadow there. Sometimes I will wet, especially on hot press paper where it's a little bit more finicky, I will wet all the way up to the edge of the paper just so that I don't end up with a hard edge somewhere. We're gonna be using pastel over this if you choose to, you don't have to, but I know I'm gonna be using pastel so I don't have to be as careful. But if you're gonna keep it just for watercolor, I want you to know these tricks so that you don't end up with some weird hard edges or marks and then you'll be upset if they're it's kind of stuck in your painting. Do the same thing up here just to darken right beyond the um, the napkin and then I'm actually just going to throw in just a little bit of toning to uh, just give a little bit of depth just kind of darken it up back here. Still using that dark mix that we made. Now there is a little bit of a sun dappling effect on the um, on the background and we can do that in a couple different ways uh, and I'll show you the reference photo because I didn't do it quite the same way on my painting the sun dappled area I think if we take a pipette and we drop in some we put a little more gray in there and we drop in some color I think we can really get a very similar effect while our paper is still wet uh, Three-eyed Robin, approximately how many years do they consider the light fastedness lasting with professional watercolors? It Would a student grade watercolor last with proper treatment? Um, you know, it really depends. Some colors in a student range are going to last longer than colors in an artist range. And there's some colors in an artist range that are not going to last 10 years. So you really have to look at the pigment and look at the rating of a specific color because um, like colors like opera that have a fluorescent pigment in it, they're not going to last. And uh, But people want that color. So if you wanted, you absolutely wanted that color, you can paint with it. Just um, maybe scan it and make prints and not sell originals. No, nope. I'm going to force some blooms here just by using a pipette to drop in some color. I think that will give me a nice sun dapp dappled effect. And I might actually mix up a little bit of uh, yellow in that too. Yellow and brown to give myself a little bit of a ochre color to add to that water. I don't know if that's really going to look too dappled. I've got some pretty big spots on there, but I know that I have the pastels that I can work with it, so it makes me a little braver. I'm using my pipe, but my pipe at just to pick up some of that color and squirt it in there. Spattering 2.0, guys. <laughs> we'll see if anybody's still watching after we're done with spattering. <laughs> oh yes, people do love spatter. They love it or they hate it. That's that's the thing with spatter. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, so we get some texture back there. I'm gonna leave that be. And I'm gonna start in with washes on the cherries. I'm gonna use my number eight round for this. And I'm gonna grab some yellow here. And I'm gonna put a little bit of my rose red in there. So I warm it up a little bit. And a little bit, I'll use my paper again. I can add a little bit of water to that. And everything's dry around the cherry, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pretty much paint them all in with this yellow color. I'm not gonna worry about what I can see through the glass at this point. I will uh, deal with that after. I'm gonna just kind of treat this like one big mass. I'm even going over the stem there because the yellow's light enough that uh, it can handle it. And I know some of the paintings we've been doing lately on the live streams have been a little more advanced. Next week's is gonna be really easy. So if you've been um, intimidated or maybe just didn't feel like jumping in on one of these more, these longer paintings, next week's is gonna be much more. Um... But if you are doing these, don't rush. Don't try to you know get it done in a certain amount of time. Leave it on your desk where you can walk by it and make adjustments if needed. I find that's the best way to improve a painting is just to let it sit. And as you walk by, you know, put a little mark here and a little mark there. I'm mixing up some more color. This one has a little more red in it. That's all right. Still very light. If you've never painted on hot press paper before, um, it's, it, it is a little different. It almost feels like you're painting on a student grade paper because it doesn't quite absorb as much and it's a lot easier to get blooms. So you may find it quite frustrating if you've been painting with cotton hot press paper for a while, uh, cold press paper for a while, and then you go into the, um, uh, then you go to the hot press. Because like with the, with the cold press, we can keep working back in and not get blooms. It blends a little bit more. With a, with a smoother surface though, there isn't really anything to stop your paint from flowing and blooming. So you do end up with a little bit more, um, like you can't really hide a flaw as well. On the, it's, like a, it's like painting a wall. If you paint a wall with glossy paint, every imperfection shows up. That's kind of like uh, with a hot press paper. It's great at capturing details, but it will capture those details that you don't, you might not want captured. Okay, so we have pretty much yellows and peaches. Um, my monitor looks like it's a little more peach than yellow, but there is there's a good mixture of yellows and peaches in there. I'm gonna mix up some green. I'm gonna use a phthalo blue and the yellow, which is POI 154, permanent yellow. You could also use Hansa Yellow Light. That would work out really well. And you can just go ahead and give all of your mint leaves a uh, coating with this. And when in doubt, go lighter with this first coat because you're going to be adding layers. If you want another tutorial using hot press paper, the um, real-time cat tutorial I did earlier this week, the really long one with watercolor pencils, that's done on hot press paper, and I do talk about the different surfaces of paper a lot more in that video. So uh, check that out. It also has over 20 tips on how to improve your um, watercolor pencil drawings. So you might enjoy that if you own a few watercolor pencils. Okay, I'm going to start working on our um, on our cup here. I am going to give those cherries a quick dry. Yeah, 
if I didn't dry the cherries, when I got close to them with the paint, it would end up giving me kind of like a ruffled edge. So we're gonna use it, do that technique I showed you last week with the donuts where we do the, um, we do the controlled wash. So what you wanna do is mix up more paint than you think you're gonna need. And we're just gonna go with the phthalo blue here. It's a beautiful staining transparent blue. And I want it fairly light. I'm gonna add a little bit more water in there. Pipettes are really handy because you don't have to rinse off all the good pigment on your brush if you just want to add a little water. And I think I've got plenty there. So the process for this, I'm going to do this section of the cup first. I'm going to leave the band unpainted, then I'm going to do the inside. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, there is little slices of highlight I want to preserve. I may actually do this part and work my way around into there, but I definitely want to keep this area not painted for this first section. You're gonna to need to be able to tip your, your paper, so if you're not taped down to a board, um, tape it down to a board before you do it, or at least clip it onto a board. Taping works really well. Uh, it's not gonna buckle and move on you so much. And I'm drying my leaves because I was just gonna put my wrist on my paper there and I don't wanna smudge that paint. It helps to rest your wrist on your board if you're feeling shaky at all. So we're gonna make a bead of color along the top. This works best if the object that you're painting it doesn't have a lot of um, like crazy details on the edges. You want fairly smooth edges for this. And then I'm going to keep adding paint onto that bead. So you see when I just dropped that paint in there, it didn't wanna go anywhere else. It pretty much just stayed right there. And I'm gonna keep adding paint until it's so full that it would almost wanna drip if I didn't do anything to it. So after I've got a bunch of paint in there, I'm just going to make a line directly underneath it and that's going to pull my color down. I'm just holding my board kind of at a weird angle so that the that bead of, of uh, paint is staying pretty much along that whole edge. You shouldn't be getting streaks if you do this properly. If you keep that bead of color there, we still have plenty so I don't need to reload. And by keeping that wet edge, even with a uh, staining color like this, you shouldn't have streaks. If this technique feels a little too um, awkward for you, you could just wet this area and add in your color, but you're, you're gonna notice a bigger shift from wet to dry if you do that, uh, because we only have enough water here that like to, uh, to dilute our paint to where we want it. We don't have extra water for the wash, so we don't get as much shift when it dries. And take your time with this. Obviously, you don't want to let that wet edge dry. You want to keep moving, but you don't need to rush. You can take your time. A good practice is to make a draw a bunch of boxes on some watercolor paper and practice this technique over and over again. Now, when you get to the the bottom, when you're finishing up an area and you don't, you don't need to keep that bead. You might have just enough in your brush to fill in the area, and that's what I would do. I would, you don't wanna add more to the bead when you're getting towards the bottom, as long as you have enough to finish it up. Now I'm actually going to bring this in and start filling the area down here. Since it is so small, I don't plan on adding uh, a full bead of color here. I'm just pretty much filling it in. Because your brush will still have quite a bit of paint on it, even um, even without a bead left. Just watch those edges near the cherries. Make sure you're keeping a nice smooth edge because those, those are in focus. So you don't want to have a, you, you want everything to look nice and crisp up here. Grace CRH, if you are in a craft fair and the sun is hitting your table, do you have to protect your watercolor pieces from it? I don't think that would bother you just a day at a craft fair, um, unless you're doing them every weekend and you have the same pieces in the sun. Uh, but even so, I don't think that would be that big of a deal. What you might have a trouble with and I've had trouble with is condensation 
with the sun blaring on your paintings or anything in cello bags if you use the clear bags to store your stuff so you might need to open them up and let them vent or pull them into the shade i have a canopy over my booth um when i sell because that sun will just i store everything in the basement so when i go out into the sun if the sun hits those bags it's they get they get a uh, condensation and it's not attractive and it could ruin your paintings too if they're touching we're gonna do the same thing in here we can be a little bit uh looser with it though because we don't have that much um that much space to to carry a bead of water i can use the stems as kind of natural stopping and starting points so i can keep a nice blend If you can break up a background into some smaller areas, it's a lot easier to color them. do we have hanging out today? We have 230. Nice. I sent out my monthly newsletter today, so hopefully we get some folks that don't normally get the YouTube notifications, some new new friends maybe. I can't believe it's already the 10th of August already. If you see any puddles, even if it's just a small little puddle like that, you still brush, uh, wipe your brush off and just stick your dry brush um, in that section so you don't end up with any backwash. Now I'm just taking this really diluted gray that's left on my palette and I am just going to do um, just some very faint shading on the napkin. I wish I hadn't transferred my lines so dark on the napkin because um, I feel like they are, they make the creases look way too dark. I also like to use the edge of my brush and just kind of drag color around because then it picks up some texture and it will give me a little bit of a fabric look. It works much better on the, um, on the cold pressed paper because you have that texture of the paper that's going to help sell that look. I'm going to go ahead and make up a little bit more of that shadow color so I can put some shadows around the cherries and the mint. So since this color here with the brown and the blue look green, I add in the red to neutralize the green. You always go opposite on the color wheel when you are trying to make a shadow or neutralize something. And I'm going to pre-wet the areas where I want to add the shadow because I don't want them to go too dark on me. I'm going to dry my brush off. Just pick up a little bit of that color on the tip of my brush. It'll wick into the, the, the brush so I don't end up with too much, but I have plenty. And I'm just going to paint this right along the edge of the mint and it can feather out into the wet paper. If you're not sure if you're gonna like hot press paper and you don't wanna invest in a whole uh, pad or a big sheet of it, you can try mixed media paper because it's very similar. And um, mixed media papers, even if you don't end up liking the surface so much, um, if it's just way too smooth for you, you can always use the mixed media paper for sketching with light watercolor washes. So it's just a, a cheaper way to get used to that paper and you can decide whether it's for you or not. I've never been a big fan of hot pressed paper, but after doing that cat the other day, I really uh, enjoyed it. So I figured I'd give it another shot here. I just think because you can see all the imperfections like that wash on cold pressed paper would have been smooth as glass on hot pressed paper. You're going to see, you will see a few strokes here and there. So it's just a little less, a little less forgiving. Any questions? No, we're caught up for the moment. Quiet bunch. 
Well, they're chatting in amongst each other, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. I'll go back sometimes and read the chat. Yeah. See what everyone's been, see what I'm missing out on. Okay, now we're going to work on the cherries one by one. Uh, I'm going to start with this one because I think, well, I'm going to give us a real quick dry. So basically when you're doing the next layer on the cherries, you're not going to work on a cherry that's touching another cherry that you've just worked on because the color can wick into the next one. So you want to make sure that you can kind of jump around. Actually, I think I'll start back there because that way if I do, you know, if it does feather or mess up, it's in the background where it would be fuzzier anyway. So I'm going to wet this cherry. And I am going to grab some of my, my rose red. A little bit of that orange mix that I made before. And I'm going to add that into the edges around the stem here. I'm going to clean my brush and grab some yellow. These Rainier cherries have kind of a two-tone red and yellow, orange type coloring. And I'm going to add some of that in there and just kind of let it, let the colors flow together. We really can't see much of a highlight on this one back here, so it's pretty much just adding the colors on. And you can feel how they will blend together. You get an idea for how concentrated you want it before you start on one of the other cherries. If you get too much color in there, you can just dab it and soften it. And it's not going to soften to white because you have the underpainting, so you don't really have anything to worry about there. I'm going to move over to this one here, which is almost all red. I'm just going to give it a little pre-wetting here. I'm going to grab the red. And just try to keep your edges nice and crisp. And because of the yellow underpainting, I really don't need to add any yellow to that. Now I'm going to go, I think I'll go to this one here. I'm going to pre-wet it. Not to the edges, just pretty much pre-wet in the middle. My brush wasn't completely clean, but that's all right, because I'm going to be adding red. Just a little bit of yellow on it to take out the, um, the coolness of it. Turn your paper if you need to. There, I'm gonna let the yellow show through on this one and just kind of leave that as it is. There is a highlight, like a square highlight on the front of that. So I am going to press that pretty firmly and take out a little bit of that there. And there's also a smaller highlight on this guy back here and I'm going to press that out too while I'm at it. We'll go to this one next because remember we don't want to have any of our cherries touching. And we're going to do the same thing. I don't think I need to add any yellow to this one because it's like that one in the front. We're going to see the yellow underneath just fine. And the edge that's facing us is a little more red. I'm going to wet my brush and just drag it, spread it out a little bit.
and you'll notice less color shift when you're not using so much water. So you can get it pretty accurate and not have to uh, go mess with it much beyond that. And remember to blot your highlight out. We'll go up to this one here. Pre-wet a little bit. This one's just going to have a little bit of red on it. Pick up a little bit of that yellow. And that one has a little bit more pop of yellow in it, so I'm just going to grab some more of that. Make sure that when you're going into a wet area, you don't have more uh, wet on your brush than the paper has, or you're going to have, you're going to be uh, having a bloom there. This one's quite a bit yellower than what we had. Do we have a question? No. Oh. I just lost in. So I'm going in with pretty much pure yellow here. And then I'm just going to add a little bit of red to the outside so it can kind of flood in. Now I don't worry about doing red over the stems because I know the stems will, will stand out on that, but if I had a strong red, I would be careful. Yellow over the stem is fine though. Now this rose red set, uh, paint is not in the um, starter set of Turner's. Um, it's a beautiful color. It isn't their bigger, the set that has the 15 milliliter tubes. So if you're looking for this color, um, either buy it separately along with this, the starter set or you can get the set with the larger tubes. But that's a little bit more of an investment if you're going with that bigger set. And we're only using four colors here, so if you want to try out the paints and not purchase a whole set, you can get them individually in tubes and it's, they're very affordable. They might even be cheaper by the tube than by the set if you're not getting the, the 18 tube starter set, which is the best deal, I think. Now there's also a little bit of a texture on these cherries and you'll see it sometimes and you can just kind of scribble your brush a little bit, the tip of the brush, to give it a little bit of that texture. It's kind of almost like a grainy texture, um, almost like a nectarine has. So you can kind of scribble a little bit of that in there if you need to. There isn't much of a highlight on this one because the cherry, this cherry here is blocking it, but there is a tiny little sliver. So I'm going to fold my paper towel so I have kind of a line and just kind of rock it in like that and leave it. There's, I don't want to overdo it because there isn't much. We'll go to this one now and pre-wet. I'm going to go right in with the red and start it up here, kind of dark. And then tap my brush because there's definitely a lot more texture on this one. And I can tap it into the wet and it's gonna give me a soft, grainy texture that I want. You can cool, you can warm up that red with just a smidgen of the yellow if it's too uh, cool for you. Because it is a pretty uh, cool red. But it does mix nice, so. And it's strong, so that's a that's a good red. I wish they put that. I wish they would put that in the 18 set instead of that Mayan red. I'm not a fan of the Mayan colors that are in that starter set. If anyone has a good use for those Mayan colors, let me know because they just kind of sit there. And you can also dab like dot your brush to give it a little bit of a stippling and it will fade out a little bit and it will give you that realistic texture. Hopefully. I don't think it's glaring too badly. I think you can see that all right. Let me know if anyone's, if you're seeing glaring on yours. It looks good from here. Okay. I know my palette always glares like crazy. I should see if I can find a palette that doesn't glare, but if I've got anything wet, it seems to really Well, that's, yeah, you, get gotta, shiny. you have to have the lighting, which means glare, because you're gonna have wet. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna leave that one be for a minute and come over to the leaves. I'm not gonna fuss on the leaves too much because, you know, you could spend all day doing leaves. They're, they're very, they're very complex. So I'm just gonna hint at some of the texture. I got way too much water in my paintbrush there. 
Uh, Grace Blosser, what does Lindsay think of the Turner odor? It's the reason I haven't been able to pull out mine to use for a while. Mine don't smell at all. Not even when I pour them fresh. Um, Grace, if your paints have an odor and the Turner watercolors, I would contact Jerry's because I've had two sets. I've, this is the 15 milliliter set that I have now, like set of 24, and I had the 18 set. And I didn't have any odor with these. I, there, I noticed a slight odor with the Shinhan watercolors I used last week when they were fresh from the tube before they dried out. Um, but I don't, and I'm, I don't know if I'm really sensitive, but I notice it when my watercolors have an odor to them. So I think I would contact them if you've got some odor on your paints. I don't, I, I wonder if there was a bad batch or something, but I'm sure they would go good for them if, if they smell because they shouldn't. They're pretty good over there. I've had to, um, even before I started doing sponsored videos from them, I always ordered my frames from them. And every once in a while you get one with a dent in it, you know, it's just par for the course. And they always went, went good for them. It's always nice when a company has great customer service like that. Yes. And you don't always expect it when you have like a company that does discount pricing. Mm. Yeah, a lot of times you're like, well, that's why you get what you pay for, yeah, you know? That's why it's a, that price. Yeah, because I, like, there's some paints, like the Marie's paints, and I noticed that some, it seems to be um, some of the the Asian brands, like the, the Marie's watercolors have a very strong odor. Shin Hands had a, had a faint odor, but it was enough that I, that I recognized it. It must be something they put in to preserve the paints. And the Turners, I think they might be, might be made in Asia. I'm not sure. I don't have my original box. I don't have a, a tube right here. Um... So it could just be a, a preservative, but my turners have never had any odor. She says it was a couple of, a, she got them a couple of years ago. But still, they shouldn't have, gosh, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have an odor. I mean, watercolors don't. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to send an email. It wouldn't hurt, no. Or call. I mean, you know. Yeah, they could have had like a, they could have had a, an odd batch go out or something. You never know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lynn Justice is saying she doesn't notice any order with hers. Oh, that's good. And Eve Bolt says uh, she also thinks Turner's made in Japan. And I really couldn't see this leaf very well in my reference photo, so I'm just going to kind of fudge it. Just put some... some <laughs> some marks to indicate veining and if it looks too streaky like this looks a little streaky i'm just going to brush a little water over it to make it a little more out of focus because it's better if you can't see like i'll show you my reference photo it's very out of focus here so if you can't really see um try unless you really know the anatomy of the plant really well i would just try to kind of fuzz it out a little bit there we go. Okay, now let's work on our glass a little bit. We're going to be doing some of the darker layers. I'm going to go with phthalo blue on its own. My brush is not going to be as soupy though. So I'm getting the paint out and I'm going to blot my brush. I'm blotting the belly of it, not the tip, because I want the tip to be nice and pointy, but I'm taking that moisture out of the belly. And I am going to try not to stick my hand in the wet paint. I'm going to put a swash of the color there. If you have any wiggly edges, you can fix them at this stage. You can also turn your um, your page, your paper, your board so that it is comfortable. I feel like if I can pull a stroke towards myself or tw towards my dominant hand, I have much better results. So as I'm making the shape, the sides I'm I am keeping aware of are the curves on the glass at the bottom and at the front and in the middle. So I want to make sure that the, these these uh, shadows, these refractions I put on are agreeing with those shapes. You can also do kind of like wavy lines like that because glass will distort and give you reflections like that. Uh, and it's almost better not to be super precise unless you absolutely know what you are uh, what you are sketching because an ill-placed line is worse than not having that detail in it at all. Now here I'm just going to kind of, I am 
bringing my my brush along that ridge, but I'm kind of dabbing it to give me the, the uh, hint of that textured um, beaded edge. And then I'm going to just kind of put a dab on each of these little uh, these little pearls of glass here. I love those old, um, those milk glass, I think it's milk glass, and mm -hmm. they have all those like little, I don't know what they call them, pearls or beads or what, you know, they have that texture, those. Yeah, they're cool. I like the ones that are kind of that um, aqua color. Mm, That's so yeah. pretty. And then I'm gonna put some streaks coming down the side like this. It's just the tip of my brush is just grazing it and it really starts to add your dimension in there. Um, this edge of the glass, we don't have a lot of light getting to it and we're looking through several layers of it when you're kind of looking down on that lip. So we want this to be nice and dark. I'm just I'm just using that same one color with more, um, with more pigment, less water. So we're not mixing um, because I find that with glass, you want to avoid the mud at all, co at all costs. So if I start mixing to get a shadow, a neutral, I might end up neutralizing it and losing that vibrancy, and I don't want to do that on glass. Uh, Benny Chavez, have you had any problems with your travel palette that fans out sticking to each other? Um, when I used a brush that wasn't a um, the water brush, like that came with it, because I usually just use that. When I used some real brushes, um, I did notice that I was putting more water on my pans and they were kind of swelling a little bit. So I let them dry, opened up, but I haven't had issues with, if I'm using the water brush, um, I did have them stick a little bit, but I opened it up and it didn't hurt anything. There might've been a little bit of residue on the fan up above, but of course it can't mix with any other colors because um, it only touches that one spot on the, the uh, area up above. So I didn't have any, any uh, side effects or anything. Obviously, so you could just let them dry, fanned out if that's giving you an issue. And if you live someplace more humid than we are, which doesn't seem possible after this week, <laughs> <laughs> then you might need to let it dry longer. <laughs> and you can layer shadows upon shadows and that gives you a nice transparent look. Whoops, awkward angle. So that would be an example of not having your line right. So I'm gonna go in and correct that here. Just drag it out. It's gonna agree with one of them. It's either gonna agree with the one on the bottom or the one towards the middle. So I'm going to, I'm using this, this curve to kind of guide me a little bit. Now we're gonna get some work on the rim over here. I'm gonna turn this around so I don't lay my hand in it. I'll turn my reference photo upside down too, so I am looking at it the way, so I can look at it and see exactly where the shadows are easily. And again, I want this, this rim to be, I want it to be dark down here. As I come up to the stem, it's still dark. And then as I get further up, I am gonna let it kind of let the, the shadows split so that I will end up with still a sliver of highlight. But I'm gonna sharpen up that edge. Hopefully I didn't stick my head in the way there. I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna give myself a sliver of that dark up high. So I'm just leaving that lighter channel in the middle. And I'm going to um, kind of fill this color in a little bit, try to sharpen up my edges. I've got to rest my arm on, on the table or I'm gonna get it all shaky. So, or on my board rather. So do what you need to do to get your lines the way you want them. And that may be using a colored pencil and not doing this with a brush. And you can always lay your colored pencil on after if you need to. So don't let the, what is that saying? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good or something, something like that. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah.
and I'm just scumbling here, which is just kind of ta uh, tapping and scribbling with my brush. Just a little bits of, of um, I can see a little bit of that detail on the outside of the glass. I'm just dabbing in to show the refractions in the glass and uh, just hinting at it. Hmm. I forgot a cherry in here, I see. <laughs> we'll see how this paper scrubs. Let's see. So there should be a cherry right here, otherwise I've got hovering cherries in the <laughs> air. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can scrub out, which it is... It just fell. It's an action shot. Yeah. Now, hot press paper does not take the same level of scrubbing that a cold press paper will. I think that's probably why I've never been that crazy about it, but um, but if you like to work slow and in layers and do botanicals, it's really a wonderful paper to, to use. But just like everything, not every supply is going to be your cup of tea. Somebody can love something and you can absolutely hate it. Uh, so I'm just going to go in. I am going to go a little bit thicker in with a paint. And actually, I'm going to go ahead... I'm going to paint this whole area in here because I think there would be a bunch of cherries that you probably can't see. And so I'm just going to get this and it's going to end up being neutralized because of all the sun, the phthalo blue that's down there already. So it's not going to be a bad thing. I'm just going to try not to make that cherry next to it really bumpy because I think I must have too much coffee today. I'm feeling very shaky. I know I should have had another cup of coffee because I'm not feeling very awake. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I didn't think I had that much, but it was um it was a French roast and I think I made it a little on the strong side, so it was probably more like espresso. All we need to do is hint. Got that cherry in there. People say that watercolor is really hard because you can't make changes. You can totally make changes. This is case in point here. Got some deep buried cherries there. Lighten up that area just so it looks like there's one in front. Sasnu, do you think a 36 pan set from Schminky is a good option? I like tubes more, but I could only find the pans. Oh yeah, and that would give you more than enough colors. Schmink is a beautiful, um, a beautiful brand. I actually prefer pans to tubes. They're just harder to find around here, and usually tubes are a better deal. But um, if you're going to buy a set, usually pans are, the, are a great option because you get them in a pallet generally. And so then you can just buy a tube as you run out and refill it, and then you can reduce the plastic waste of, of purchasing uh, the colors and pans after that. Doing that same texture technique, just kind of Kind of put some lines in there. Brightening up the yellow. When you're drawing your um, your picture to watercolor, especially if you have white areas like the napkin, I highly recommend that you draw as light as you can, um, just so that you can still see your design. I noticed for this picture, especially doing the, the demo piece that those dark lines, I was really noticing them and they were affecting how how much shadow I wanted to put on things. I want to put on more shadow than I needed because the lines were so dark. And even though that one next to it is not completely dry, I'm going to go ahead and paint this so we can move along. A little bit of yellow right there. And then we'll do our red back here. I like to use the side of the brush for kind of blending and texturing a little bit too. 
And I want it a little bit darker in here, so I am going to take uh, the red a smidgen of the uh, the thalo blue. It's going to make kind of a purple, and I'm going to go ahead and put it up here in that little dimple. And I'm also going to bring it back here along this edge of the cherry and make this fade into the shadows here. So I'm going to bring that edge of the cherry back so it kind of dissolves into nothing. Okay, I'm going to make some green. Got the phthalo blue and the yellow. So I'm going to start off with this kind of bright and I'm going to paint in some of the stems. Just make sure you don't drag your hand through your paint. I can have Jason make you a cup of coffee if you want. Oh no, I'll be alright. I'll grab one. I have to go into town and take care of some errands. I'll grab one on the way. Oh. Do you ever go to Coffee Express? I don't, because I'm never out that way. Oh, wrong area of town. I, yeah. I wish they were still on Brewer. They used to have one on Brewer. I love their coffee, and they're local, so I always try to... Yeah, I just usually go to Dunkin' Donuts, because it's right, it's on the way. Oh. And, or, you know, I'll also make my own and bring it. Yeah. Up. My kids love Dunkin', well, the girls love Dunkin', but they like these things. They're like, well, I'm not an iced coffee fan, but it's like... Like a milkshake, practically. Oh, yeah. They're, oh, it's I don't, awful. I just it's drink, just sugar and caffeine. I just drink... My coffee is black, so I don't do iced coffee because cold black coffee isn't appealing to me, so... I have friends, you know, it's like three sugars and three creams and the hazelnut swirl flavor and some whipped cream and... I don't know. I'm just like, holy moly. <laughs> You're probably better off just eating some ice cream or having a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like soy milk in mine or black. I like it with soy milk right. and some equal or I'll have it black. In my tea, I just have soy milk in it. Yeah. John gets it. He gets the flavored coffee. He'll get a flavored coffee and yeah. then he'll put a little cream in it like mm -hmm. when he gets it. But he doesn't put any sugar or anything. I don't like their flavored coffees because they're so sweet. They're sweet without any sugar well, in it. Well, you have to, it depends. If you're getting, are you getting the actual flavored coffee or are you getting the flavor shots? Because it's well, the flavor they, shots. It, that's because some, because I think that's what they do. I don't think they brew up fresh flavor, like they fresh flavored coffee. They do. You can get it the fresh. Okay, they must have, I don't often buy my but coffee they only, But there, you can so. only get French vanilla or hazelnut uh, yeah. for the flavored coffees. Like it's brewed fresh. Otherwise, it's a flavor shot. Right, okay. Well, I And don't that's like... where the sweet is coming from. Yeah, I don't like the sweet. I'm just going to give a little bit more uh, punch of red on some of these, and I'm going to try to help it shape by um, putting some brush strokes that are going with the contour of the cherry. Yeah, I tell, I tell the viewers to stay on topic, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> what kind of coffee do you like? You want some? <laughs> Well, you know, we're allowed to do what we want. We're doing all the hard work, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know. If they're painting along at home, they're doing some hard work, too. <laughs> okay, they get a they get a break. But everybody else... Yeah. These cherries, it's funny to paint cherries like this because they have a visual texture of those striated colors, but they're they're smooth. They don't have an actual surface texture. So it can be a little tricky to paint these guys. But with the smooth paper, it does help convey that texture a little bit that we're, that we're going for. more up here. Side of that brush can be your best friend there to get some subtle texturing in. Using the side of the brush, just dragging it up. Creative Planet Janet, isn't Turner the house brand of Jerry's? Yes, it's one of their house brands. They have a lot of house brands. 
although I have seen it sold or they might just have exclusive rights in the United States to sell it because I, I have seen it sold overseas in other stores. So I think it might, I think they might be the exclusive United States distributor. But they do, um, they they do have a few, cause like I think the same thing with Lucas, but they're not the, I think there's other countries that have dealers that, that sell Lucas, but I think they might be the only United States distributor. So they can give massive discounts on those particular brands. I really like their Lucas products. Their Lucas oils are fabulous because they're the only ones that are dry to the touch the next day. I've been oil uh, in a couple weeks on Friday, but we'll be doing an oil tutorial, which will also be a beginner friendly one too. So if, if you've been curious about oils, that would be a great one to tune into or watch the replay for. I've been wondering if maybe people are tired of watercolor because I, I feel like the longer watercolor tutorials are are having a hard time getting um, getting traction on YouTube. I'll try something else, see if anybody wants some oils. Okay, um, I am going to skip ahead. If you want to keep layering with watercolors, go right ahead. I'm going to skip to the color pencil portion just because this is kind of a longer tutorial and I want to kind of get you through the steps so that you can finish it to your level of realism at home. And we'll be using colored pencils next. I am using Prismacolors. You can use any brand. And I just have a handful. Uh, and I'll go over the colors while I'm drying this. I've got a yellow that's, um, I can read them off individually. We have got a sunburst yellow, which is kind of like a warm gamboge type color. And I have a deco yellow, which is kind of like a creamy yellow. I'm not sure if deco yellow is still being made, so it just looks like a pastel yellow. For the two greens, I have a grass green and a, um, spring green. You could also use chartreuse or green apple. I've got a light aqua. I have a peacock blue. And use whatever blues you find closer, close enough to that. I've got a white. I have an indigo. Indigo works great for black in a lot of cases. Um, I do have a black. I have a cold gray medium. That would be a cold gray 50% if you have a, a grays with percentages. A Scarlet Lake. A, this looks like poppy red. Poppy red. And a burnt ochre, which is very similar to burnt sienna. All right, so we're going to start right in on the glass because I think glass, people find glass the most challenging. I really wish I sharpened all of these upstairs on my electric pencil sharpener, but I did not think to do that. And I'm going to go into my brightest highlights and lock them down. Uh, Annette Fournier, uh, water mixable oils or traditional for the next, for that tutorial? You can use either. It does not matter a bit. They perform the same way and um, they're very, very similar. Um, I want to get the strong highlight that's going down the center. So kind of here and here. Well, I want to go ahead and get that in right about there. You want the slant of that line to be between the angle there and the angle there. Uh, Joe Maisky, what was your rationale for switching to hot press? The color pencil work or were the watercolor layers too textured for um, your liking? Both, but mainly because I was depicting something smooth. That using a smoother paper is usually a little bit uh, better for capturing the detail in smooth things. And also just to kind of show you the difference in the, in how it will look uh, by the different papers. So you could kind of see side by side two paintings and you could see how they, um, how they turned out in case you were after a different effect than what I usually show. So again, this line here, I'm continuing on from that and it is kind of in between where we have there, but a little closer to this angle because it's further closer to that like it's not smack dab in the middle it's a little bit closer to this edge so it's going to be influenced by that angle more than that angle 
I have not sharpened my pencil, so I'm doing the areas that are wider first. And I wouldn't go this quick normally, but I am trying to keep this tutorial to a reasonable length. Sarah's gonna fall asleep over there if I don't. No, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna fall asleep. I'm just, I should have had that extra cup this morning. It's been a long week, so I'm happy it's Friday. Yeah, that's a different schedule for you, learning different softwares and different processes and the excitement of a new business. I'm bringing in some light here to show the napkin as it is through the glass. And I can give little highlights on any of those little dimples that we see. Now I do need to sharpen this. I keep several sharpeners in a cup, um, like an old Pringles container on my desk because I inadvertently will get something, get lead stuck in something and I'll have to switch to another one. So I should just um, pony up and get another electric sharpener for down here. I have one upstairs that I love and it was one of those deals where I got it at like Martin's or Ocean State job lot and it's discontinued and I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> so it's, it's a, uh, I don't know if I'll ever find another one like it. It's an old Office Depot brand, so, but we don't have Office, Office Depot around here or Office Max. I can't remember the foray brand. But we don't have that store up here. So no, we might be able to find it online. Probably. Everything's online. Can't find it online. It's not available. Now I'm also gonna jump right in on the cherries with this um, and I'm gonna go in with those highlights first because I wanna go ahead and get those preserved. And I'm just kind of scumbling, meaning I'm kind of like scribbling. So I keep a little bit of texture to them. I don't want them to look like glass. And they're not really gonna show up that much because I don't have a lot of contrast and I'm going over where I already lifted a highlight, like blotted a highlight off. But I find that if I really want something bright to go in with a white pencil first and kind of, because your paper is gonna take, the first color you put down the paper for colored pencil, the paper is gonna take it better and, and it's gonna influence your color a little bit more. So I wanna make sure that I've got that red and that uh, white in there first. Especially a smoother paper because it's not gonna take as much color as the, um, as a rougher paper. The rougher paper has all that tooth that can hold more colors. Now I'm using that sunburst yellow and I'm going to glaze over some of these cherries. I'm using the edge of my pencil for two reasons. One, um, I have no decent sharpener down here. So if I use it on the edge and I turn my pencil as I go, it's gonna keep it sharp for when I need it for details. So there's a pencil lead conserving tip for you or you know to eliminate the amount of sharpening you need to do and it will also keep me from denting the paper and leaving marks that might be difficult to deal with later uh, gail ac do you think that the hot press paper works better with the colored pencils i personally prefer cold press um, i find that i can it, it holds a lot of pencil and I find it's a little more forgiving because if you're, I can tend to be a little sloppy sometimes. I don't, I think it probably depends on how much time you're gonna put onto the piece. If you wanna do a really accurate botanical representation and like you could, you you'd probably want the hot press because you're gonna be meticulously putting every tiny little stroke and maybe using very tiny little brushes. Um, but if you're like me and you're, you would get bored after a while working in that fashion, you might want to cold press because it just holds more and you can go in with like pastel and it's still going to stick and have enough tooth to, to grab on. Um, with watercolor pencils, you might prefer the, the hot press just because it's not going to take so much media to cover. I think it's personal preference more than anything, really. It's great for detail, but it, it totally depends on how you like to work. Do you want to spend that much time in detail? Do you prefer a rougher texture that's gonna give you more expressive lines? It really depends on your what you're after for a final look and how you like to work in the process. Uh, I'm, very, oh, oh so I'm definitely a more loose painter 
than than a lot of people so i that's why i prefer the cold press i think it's not better or worse it's just what you like uh, mary mulligan is Lindsay using green or red phthalo blue uh green shade it's always green shade unless it's unless it's specifically noted otherwise it's very rare that thalo blue is thalo blue red shade And I've just got this, I'm still kind of bouncing around with a poppy red. And I'm going to go in with the scarlet and sharpen up some details. I am going to sharpen that up a little bit though because I don't really have enough point on there. So this would be where you want to refine some edges. add some shadows this this scarlet is going to give shadow to some of the yellow areas do it on the edge of the cherries and it's going to give you roundness on the edges that are that are darker obviously you can put it up in like the dimples of the cherries where the stem comes out you can also draw some of the grain in I missed a stem. I'm just going to put it in with pencil. Now I'm noticing that I'm already having a problem with my um, with my paint wanting to stick or my colored pencil wanting to stick where with the cold pressed paper I could put tons and tons of colored pencil on before I started to feel that um, wax saturation. So you're probably more likely to get a bloom on your um, on your pieces on a hot, on a smooth paper. But if that happens, you can get rid of the bloom by spraying it with fixative or brushing on a little uh, odorless mineral spirits paint thinner because it's going to dissolve that wax and just leave the pigment behind. But when you put it on there, don't just brush, brush, brush like you're painting a house. Go in and just like you'd paint one cherry because it's going to dissolve it and leave it where you do that. So you don't want to be going back and forth like you're painting a house or you're going to smear your pigment everywhere. Uh, Lucy uh, Baylor John, are you burnishing the paper with your pencils? I really am. Um, it's I'm kind of at the point where it's not going to take more pencil unless I'm burnishing. So if you were on cold press, you really wouldn't be burnishing at this stage, but I definitely am with the uh, with the hot press paper. I have to say, I don't enjoy working with the hot press as much as I did the cold press. I'm brightening up the highlights on my mint over here, just with my uh, pastel yellow, my deco yellow. And I can go in and add little bits of shadow with the grass green. And I worked on my uh, practice piece um, throughout the week. It just sat on my easel. So obviously that's going to be a little bit more or quite a bit more detailed than this, but you'll be able to see the process. Now here I'm putting in some of the reflected color from the, um, from the mint onto the glass and I am going to have a little bit of that color showing through from the cherries so what I'm going to do is take my colored pencils very lightly I am just going to color a little bit on there and you could do that with the watercolors too obviously you could uh, you could go in there especially before you added glazes on and put some of that in there I wouldn't go too crazy with it you just want that little that little hint of the uh, the cherries being back there. And if that's grainier than you want, then you can use your odorless mineral spirits to, um, to soften it up. Uh, Penny Cormier, would a Prismacolor blender marker help knock down the bloom? No, that would increase your bloom because it's wax and pumice or pumice. So it's gonna make it uh, more, more waxy. 
That's a great question though. And I can throw in any little hints of color on that glass too that might be reflected. Okay, so now I'm gonna grab my gray pencil here. This is my cool gray medium or cool gray 50%, depending on what brand you're using. And I am gonna throw in a little bit of shadowing to ground my object. So I'll use the tip of my pencil right up against um, an object, right up against a cherry, and then I'll just kind of fade it off using a very light scumbling stroke. Just go on the edge there, just fade it, fade it out a little bit. Obviously you can do that with your, um, with your paint. And I wanna add a little bit of blue in there, but I like to put that on the, uh, on the glass as well. If I am gonna grab a different color I haven't used yet to be a reflection. Yeah, this aqua would be pretty. We'll throw, I'll throw it in with some of that lighter color. I'm surprised there's no phthalo blue pencil. If there is, I've just never seen it in the Prismacolor line. All right, I'm gonna put a little bit of this um, this cool gray 50, just hither and yon on the fabric. And then I'm just gonna show you what I did with the pastels because I feel like that really um, kind of gave it the cohesiveness that I needed. And the, the cool thing that was on the um, <clears throat> on the paper here is when I dragged my, my pencil like that, I picked up the cold press texture and it gave me that fabric-y, that linen feeling, which I'm just not getting the hot press paper. <clears throat> All right, so I've got a, um, a pastel. I'd say this is probably like a, I would say it's a, probably like a cool gray 30. The uh, Gold Faber pastels don't have names on them, or if they do, I've never, I've, I've never seen them. If they have a color key in the box, I've never noticed it. Uh, but they're a very affordable pencil um, pastel. You get like 60 colors for under $30. So it's it's nice if you want the colors, you want to get into it, but you're not sure if you're going to like it, and you're not sure if you want to spend a lot of money. So I'm just getting that down there and I'm gonna blend it out a little bit. I just want some loose fuzzy texture in the background. And I can also take my finger and bring it into the fabric area too and just kind of blend around a little bit, cross harmonize my colors. I'm gonna grab the darker shade. I'd say it was probably a cool gray 70. A little shadow behind the napkin, maybe uh, Hint at some planks a little bit. I'll smudge them out a little bit just because I just want that that hint. And then something that I did in the <clears throat> that's not in the reference photo because it's a little too blurry, but I did on this is I used my colored pencil to and pastels to give me the hint of wood grain. So I'm gonna do that with a pastel. It's a little bit quicker, but you could use pencils if you're more comfortable with that. Uh, in reference to the earlier question about using the blender marker. Uh-huh. Oh, did you say marker and I thought pencil. Okay, it was, yeah, it was It was marker. marker. Yep, I'm the alcohol I'm sorry. Thing. Oh my gosh, I was thinking the Prismacolor blender pencil. Yes, the marker would take out the, the bloom. Who needs a coffee now? <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. My apologies. I think better than the the uh, the marker is the is the Gamzol or the odorless mineral spirits. I find that the marker gets um because it's just kind of like the marker you would use to blend alcohol pens. I find that it gets clogged really easily. 
with uh, colored pencil pigment because it's so waxy. Now I'm going to grab some white uh, cream and yellow here and I'm going to use these for the sun dappled texture. And I think I'll start with this yellow because I'm going to get some of that kind of warm sunlight in there. Even though sunlight is usually cool, but I want that warmth in here. And then I'm going to overlay some cream. It's like the end of the day, that golden light. And a little bit of white. Now when you're using your lighter colors, um, especially over darker colors, it's going to pick up some of the uh, pastel. So you just want to wipe it on like a, a paper towel or tissue or rag so that you can get the, the extra um, color off before you go elsewhere. So if I take that, wipe it off like I'm wiping it on my hand, that's going to be fine. And then I can go in and I can, like if my shadowing was too much and I want this to be a little bit more creamy looking, I can go in and add highlights add wrinkles. I really like this cream color on the uh, on the fabric for highlights. And you can go in and do as much or as little as you want. And you can go in and accent your uh, wood grain a little bit. But remember, that's background. It really should be pretty out of focus. Now I do want to pump up my um, my cherries, make them look a little creamy. This is probably not gonna stick very well. This isn't really how um, you're supposed to lay down media on top of each other, but I do find it works. Um, you would definitely want a fixative over this because what's happening here is this pastel is gonna fall into the crevices of the tooth that's left on your paper and it's going to make everything appear a little bit smoother and creamier but it's not gonna have a really fantastic bond with your paper because of the colored pencil. So just make sure you do use a fixative on this um, if you're gonna just like stick it in your, your uh, flat file for storage. And sometimes if you add a fixative on top, you can add more media. Uh, Penny Cormier, how would you apply the Gambasol to knock the waxy bloom? With a brush or a Q-tip? Um, I would do a brush or a like blending stump. I'm putting in my highlights again with the pastel. And then I can also go over the jar with some pastel. I had some green on my some white on my finger. That's all right. It's a color that I already used here, so it works. And I don't have any. I just had those few colors that I used on my um, my practice piece, so I'm just going to grab some colored pencils to deepen the colors that were that I didn't have the pastel to go over. And then for a final touch, I'm just going to use a white paint pen and give it those final highlights. Um, obviously, like I mentioned before, take your time and put as much uh, time and energy in this. Um, oh, I didn't use any black pencil, but that did, or indigo, but that can give you some really beautiful shadows too. So if you feel like you just need a little bit more dark somewhere, try your indigo. That's going to really make your cherries uh, stand out and pop because there's a, that blue is opposite. So just with a little bit of indigo that made it pop out a little bit more. 
and then I'm just going to do some brighter highlights with the paint pen. Of course, this is optional, just like all of the mixed media techniques we did today. Just be careful, you might end up, you might not want to stick on top of, yeah, it doesn't want to stick on top of the pastel. I don't think I put the pastel highlights on the other one. Oops, I just pulled the nib out of there. I'll just put a little bit of sparkle on the jar and call that good. But there you have it. Those are all the techniques you need to do this piece. Um, I spent more time on the other one, as I mentioned before. And here is the final one there. I have my background a little bit darker. Um, and I left this up on my easel all week, and I kept looking at it as I walked by, and I'd add a mark here and add a mark there. And it really helps to approach a painting that way because you can um, you can take time, instead of making a rash decision, you can take time um, you know, deciding whether you want to add pastel or you want to skip it. You can sleep on it, and it's really, uh, really helpful. But just to show you the difference, um, you know, there's obviously a few more layers here, but you have a lot more grain uh, in the background. Whether you like that or not, you're going to get a much smoother effect here on the hot press paper. But the hot press is not going to hold as much media as the cold press. The cold press you can keep layering and layering and layering because it's got that tooth to grab onto that extra media. So um, hopefully that helps you when you're deciding what sort of paper you want to use on your next project. And uh, hopefully that helps you get out some of your other materials that you've been curious about trying. Do we have any questions before we go? We're all caught up. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up before you go and tell your friends if you like this. Until next time, happy crafting.